So it's a time for everything. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for your prayers. Um, Tori and I uh, are so appreciative of your love and uh, thank you for your insights as well, what you heard from God. Today is really about hearing from God. The, the talk that I feel like God has given me a word for today uh, and it happened when I came. I was at a, I was at a funeral this week and um, and the reading that we just heard, that Kate just read, was one of the readings for Douglas, who um, uh, died just a few weeks ago in Avondown House. Uh, a man of character, a uh, unique guy, uh, loved music and was uh, very creative, um, very um, unique in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, but there was, a, there was something in the reading that was read that when we heard it being read to us, we were in this moment of uh, poignancy and grief. This there's a time for everything story came out over the top of us. And we were looking at this story of one man's life and then there's the time for everything. And it sort of enlarged our vision. And you know what the, the crematorium is like where the window is? If you've seen, you know, you've been there. And suddenly, you know, you're looking out over the, over the view and there's, um, there was a kind of, we're in this bigger picture, in this bigger story, in this, the, and the, there's an ebb and a flow for our lives and we're okay and we're safe and it was really strong and really powerful and I and I felt God saying that's the reading for Sunday that's the reading for Sunday so that's why we've got that and um, we're fitting it into this the theme about Jesus is our something or other and the, the, the week this week we have Jesus is our guide but really today is a bit about it's about God it's about Jesus it's about us and it's about time um, time um, thinking about time and how we use time. The graph that we are given uh, in our lives, and this is probably the strongest way that we think about time as a culture, I would suggest, um, is, is this. Basically, time goes along the bottom and there's progress upwards uh, on the other cur- uh, graph uh, uh, axes. And, and basically, this is, this, is, this is how we're headed. And everyone has this graph, and it gives it to us. Tesco's has this graph. Uh, so if you look at Tesco's, you know, what they want is they want... They want to improve on last year. Uh, if, you, if you go to school, uh, everyone wants you to go start a number one, a 1B, a 1C, a 1A, or I don't know, wherever you start. And then you go, and then you go all the way through, and then you've got, to, you've got to go upwards and keep going. And this is the story of, you know, whether it's your parents, they have a view of you, or whether it's your school, or whether it's you know, the health service, Tory works in the health service, and it's the same thing for that. And if it's a business, you want your business to grow, Everybody has a chart, and, our, our, and, and this is stamped on our DNA, that as we move through, that we ought to get better. Of course, our lives are not like this, are they? <laughs> and no one else's is. But this is, the, this is the image that we're given. This is success, isn't it? This is, this is how time should be. This is how we should journey through life. The reality is that my life is... That was a bad bit, and then there's a good bit, and then there's another bad bit. You know, the, life's all over the place, isn't it? How's yours doing? How's your graph? If, you had to, if, we, if we showed all of your graphs, we'll choose Rob's to start with. I've got Rob's. No, no we haven't got Rob's. But, yeah. <laughs> but imagine if we did have Rob's. What would it show? Where would, where would the graph be? If, it, if your graph was on there, what would happen? What would, it be, what would be displayed about your life at the moment? I think, I think there's a kind of, the, the emphasis is on this kind of 
journeying and, and therefore growing. And there's another image which I think is better, and that's a, a circle going round. And this is a more um, ancient rhythm of life. Um, uh, the sun rises and the sun sets. You wake up as the sun rises and you go to sleep when the sun sets. You rest and then the sun rises again. And then, and then the, the moon rises and it sets. And the moon has its uh, phases that you would be aware of. I mean, I don't know what size the moon is at the moment, but if I was uh, a man 100 years ago, 200 years ago, I would know what the moon, what phase the moon was in. You know, the rhythm of life would be going around. And then, of course, the seasons would be very dominant in our life. There would be a kind of circular fashion that we're going round this thing again and again and again. And our lives would be the same as previous lives as well. You know, our generation would be pretty much the same as previous generations. We're not on this kind of upward curve. We're just doing the same stuff that they did. We plant and we sow. We, we live and we die. We do these things. We're going round and round. Um, the narrative of, um, I think, of, of the Bible and the narrative of the world is perhaps more circular, or maybe it's a bit more like um, this image, a rhythmic one. Now, Tim has just um, had his heart... Um, renewed and uh, we are used to this rhythm we are used to this rhythm and again it's another quite a strong pattern in our lives and then we're used to them and we all know that we need a rhythm for our lives and then when we're out of rhythm uh, someone needs to intervene <laughs> you know if, they, if your life is out of sync well they will come along and they may even come along with those great big electronic plates and <laughs> get you back into sync again because being out of sync is not good for us The, the circle and the, if you put a circle and time, what you get is a rhythm. And the question is, are we in sync with ourselves and are we in rhythm? <sighs> Breathing. Your heartbeat right now. Just are we in, in rhythm with ourselves? Ecclesiastes 3 says there is a time for everything. Um, my mum has a place for everything. <laughs> and, and you know when it's not right. <laughs> and she would always say, the shoes. What shoes? The ones you've just taken off. Oh, I've got to move them now. I only have just taken them off. Yeah, that's not the place for them. They need to be moved to where the place is, the cupboard. Or, the, 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 or my dad's study. You could put shoes in my dad's study, but not in the hallway. That was, that was allowed. And, so, and same with time sometimes. There's a time for things, isn't it? And if you miss that time, you can sometimes think, well, that time will never come again. I don't think that that's what this passage is saying. Um, there is a time for everything. I don't think God is saying there is a moment for things to happen. And if you miss that moment, that's it. Scrubbed. You've missed it. Hard luck. Tough. Whatever the word is next. I, can't, I, I was going to say something wrong then for some reason. I don't know why. Um, it's, it's not like that. I think what God is saying is that there is a season for things. There is, a, there are, there is an ebb and a flow. There, is a, there are moments in our lives that add up to something and we need to pay attention to them. There is a time for everything. Everything has a time. So everything is important it's not like they're better or worse. These are not opposites, good and bad. These are things that will, will have to happen for life to be rich, to life to be full. In the way that the world is, there will need to be all these things. They're not good and bad. We must have those and we shouldn't have those. No, there is a time for everything. A season for every activity under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, to plant, to uproot to kill and to heal. Now, often when we read these things, which verses stand out to us? The ones with the words kill and hate stand out. Do they stand out to you? Uh, or uh, Anyone? Stand, those ones stand out? Because they, a time to kill? Is this really what is in Scripture? A time to kill? A, a time to put to death something? Is that really in Scripture? And what, what about a time to hate? Is it really okay? for? Th I thought we were supposed to love everyone and love everything. You know, what is this? time to hate thing but maybe maybe there is a moment isn't there a moment when when you when tolerance is is inappropriate when you can't 
just accept things the way they are and you need to say something, you need to speak out, you need to rise up, you need to do something, you need to hate it enough to get off your backside and do something about it. You need to have the energy of hate about something. Isn't that right? Don't we need that? Did you understand what he said? Ziggy was saying that the church needs to know that there is a time when it starts, the service starts. And he's very good at reminding us that at 10.30 the service starts. There is a time to start. And, there's a, and who's going to say there's a time to finish? Yeah, Luke. <laughs> yeah, Luke, Luke, if there's a time to finish, just kind of like signify, yeah, okay. You all understand this. Uh, the other ones that, uh, I mean, there is time to weep and a time to, there is a time to weep and then there's a time to moving on from weeping and mourning. There's a time to laugh and celebrating. And sometimes, the, what's interesting to me is that we get caught, we get stuck, don't we, in, the, in one side of the equation. We get stuck in our mourning, our, our, our groaning, or uh, we get stuck in talking and not enough listening. We get stuck in in not speaking and, and, and we're silent and we, you know, and we get stuck in those places. And, and actually what this passage needs to be saying to me is that both of these are good. It's just that you've got to work out what time is it? What time is it now? What's the right thing to do now? One of the things that struck me, verse 5, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. That's an unusual metaphor. I haven't, I, you know, I'm, we don't have stones and we don't pick them up and we don't scatter them because we don't, we're not farmers working the land all the day. But imagine if we were and we lived, we lived with our animals and, and you know, just the earth around us and every bit of every day was about tilling the earth to make sure that it had enough, you know, produced enough fruit for us to, to survive. That we would use stones. Stones would be precious, wouldn't they? Stone, not just the precious ones, but the normal stones would be precious and we would build things with them, kitchens and fireplaces and houses and... By kitchens, what I mean is little stoves and, you know, Luke went, kitchens? <laughs> In Ethiopia, they built out of stones that they gathered. They would make, they would make stuff. And, and of course, there's times to build things. And then there's time to knock those things down and to move on and to break those things down, to break those stone. And if you think of your religion as well, if you think that stones would be used as, mo- as altars, so you'd you'd bring stones together to make an altar place. And there are maybe times in, in history where, where you need to gather things together to make a place, a sacred space, and then there's a time to move on from that place. The, the Jews were a nomadic people, and there's a time to leave those stones behind. Interesting, isn't it? So what's this passage saying to us? We're invited into working out what is the right time for us. What, what, is, what is today for us? What is the season that we're in? Um, uh, I'm, I'm someone who's more likely to talk than to listen. Don't look at me like that. And others of you are like me. <laughs> um, but others of you are the opposite way round. You are more likely not to speak than to speak. And there is a time to be silent, but there is a time to speak. Now, in the first service, we had two extroverts who couldn't help but say, Oh, I, that speaks to me. I need to say They couldn't help but say it out loud. And which bit of the thing do you think they heard? There's a time to be silent. Oh, yeah, now I'm going to have to learn that one. I'm going to have to learn how to be silent. They both said it out loud in the last service. And which do you think the quiet ones thought? Which ones did they hear? They heard the thing, sometimes it's time to speak. They held the challenge, it's time to speak. The question is, it's not right to speak and it's not wrong to be silent or right to be silent. These things are not right and wrong but we've just got to work out what time is it? is it. Is it the right time to speak? Or is it the right time to shut up? Maybe. 
All of us are invited into the life of Christ. And, and, and perhaps Jesus, above all of us, uh, is the supreme person who knew what time it was. Maybe the thing that, he distinct, that distinguishes him from us is that he knew when it was right to speak and when it was right to be quiet. Do you remember when he enters the synagogue and he holds the scroll in front of him and he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, in your presence. Right now, now is the time for me to speak. He'd waited for 30 years, but today I will proclaim the kingdom of God is among you. But then at another moment, he led like a lamb to the slaughter. He was silent. And, and Pilate kept asking him questions and he would not say a word. And yet he stood on a mountaintop and proclaimed. And then after that he proclaimed, he then went away and he said, we must move on from here because we, the time is right to move on to the other villages as well. We must tell them too. It was as if the difference between Jesus and the disciples was that, Je- that he could see something and he could hear something. He could know something about what time it is. And we're invited, apparently this is the truth of, of the gospel, is that we're invited into his life. I like the idea that Jesus is invited into our lives. I like that. And that's, there's a truth there. But I like the idea that we're invited into his life even more. That we can live in him is a really good idea, really good thought. And if you wake up in the morning and think, I live in Christ, that's quite overwhelming, that's quite strong. I mean, that's, um, that means I have to live up to this reality, that if I live in Christ, then, then, then I better, my life better represent Christ. And I, the invitation is for us to gain all the God's things in Christ. You know, we get Jesus' life, and I think we get his ability to see what he saw. Now, you remember Jesus said, I do what I see the Father is doing. I wonder if someone could look up um, John chapter 5 uh, in the Bibles in front of you. John chapter 5, and I think it's verse 9 and 10. Could someone read verse 9 and 10? Uh, whoever finds it first, it's the time to speak. You put it down. I can't believe you did that. You could have... Well done, Rob. See here. John chapter... Liz has found it. Have you found it, Liz? Liz is going to read to us. So, listening to Liz. It's like, at once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, and the Lord forbids you to carry your mat. What, is, what verse is that? Is, is that John? John, chapter 5. Nine and ten. Oh, what happens in the next? Oh, keep going to verse 19. Ah, oh, flipping heck. I was thinking that's a good verse, but I'm not sure it's right. <laughs> I'm liking that one. And if that speaks to anyone here, God bless it. Yeah. Yeah, verse 19. Thank you, Liz. Jesus gave them this answer. <laughs> I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. Now that's the, that's the difference between me and Jesus. Jesus is always looking out for what his father is doing. He's always looking out. Now what the interesting word for that is he sees what the father is doing. It's like Jesus has got vision into something that I can only see darkly or kind of, I can't quite, because I, I, or at least if I'm, that's when I'm looking, because most of the time I'm probably not even looking for what the Father is doing. (laughs) But there, it's as if Jesus is constantly putting on his glasses to read what what the Father is doing. And then when he knows what the Father is doing, he will join in. And if it's healing, he will heal. And if it's speaking with authority, he'll speak with authority. If it's teaching, if it's being silent, he will be silent. If it's drawing on the ground, he'll draw on the ground. You know, there's, there's a sensitivity to Jesus because he's seeing what the Father is doing. I love that verse. I'm just wondering uh, if we've just slightly moved off the page. That's right. Oh, and just see that. 
Do you see that? For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. I love that. I hadn't seen that before preparing for this talk. The Father loves the Son. I guess he still, he loves us too. Yeah? He loves the Son and so he shows him all he does. And, and if God loves us, I mean, surely he would show us what he's doing as well. But this is not beyond us. That we're invited into Jesus' life, the same life that Jesus had with the Father, we are invited into. Are you with me on this? Do you believe this? This is, this, is, this is the foundational stuff. We're not invited to look at Jesus and just imitate him from a distance. We're actually invited into Jesus' life. So if Jesus did stuff, then we're invited to participate in that same stuff, that that stuff is made available to us. If Jesus could see what the Father is doing, then maybe we could. So how did Jesus see what the Father was doing? What are are the keys to him being able to do this? He had sight. Um, One of the words that you used a little bit was about a revelation. And often as a church, we we don't emphasize revelation enough. We we, we need to perhaps more. Maybe this will happen over the next three months while I'm away and then maybe when we come back again. That the sense of what is God saying? We need to be re- have it revealed to us in a kind of dynamic, animated way. Um, another word for revelation is guidance. Uh, but if I'd have said guidance beforehand, you probably wouldn't have said revelation. So it's interesting coming to this way around. And guidance is really... When you can't see, you get someone to guide you. Don't they? they have revelation. They have sight. And then they can guide you. If we're looking for guidance, we're looking for the sight, the revelation of God. And look what Jesus did in order to get this guidance. So Luke 5, verse 16. The news about him was spreading even further, and large crowds were gathering to hear him, and he healed their sicknesses. Good day. It was a good day. But Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness and pray. This is really interesting to me. He didn't hang around afterwards for the tea and chat. (laughs) Or for how did that go? Or for the collecting of the stickers that we talked about last week. No, he would slip away. What, What would he slip away to do? He would slip away in order to connect in order to see, in order to listen. Now, this isn't just one verse on its own. Let me just read to you another load of verses. I think, actually, I might have them on the screen, actually. Let's see if they're on the screen. Matthew 14. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray, and later that night he was there alone. Mark 1. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus, while it was still dark. (laughs) Is this possible? I'm not quite sure whether it's possible to do this. but Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. One of those days, Jesus went out onto a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. It's interesting that the story of Elijah uh, and the mountain came up earlier. Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force and to make him king, this is about them recognizing that Jesus was quite significant and they wanted to dominate that and control what they thought about him. And he, 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 he's recognizing that people want something from him. And in response to that, he withdraws again to the mountain by himself alone. Now you can see that there's a link. You can see where I'm going, can't you, with this? Uh, withdrawing is, is part and parcel of Jesus' life. There is a time for everything. There is a time for being out front, and then there's a time for withdrawing. It's time for doing something and there's time for not doing something. It's time for building something. It's time for pushing that down, stopping it. And I guess what Jesus, I've been given, gifted by the church, 
is something that I, uh, is very rare in our culture. A sabbatical is very rare, isn't it? A sabbatical is, is you could say it's a withdrawing. It's, um, it's the same word, really, isn't it? It's a, it's a stepping away from normal life. And to be gifted a, a time of rest is, is an incredibly generous thing, isn't it? Uh, no mother has a sabbatical. And, and if I tell mothers I'm going on sabbatical, they look cross about that, you know. Yeah. Well, and, and gas engineers as well. They also are slightly irritated by it. Because, because everything else carries on. How come you're able to step back? And of course, the only reason you're able to step back is because of the generosity of someone else, isn't it, really? Because life carries on in the world. Now, we're given a weekly sabbatical. We're given a weekly rhythm, and we're given a day off. And this was the thing that, that the Father in heaven gifted to creation. He said, I want you to have a rest. And, then, and in Scripture, if you read the story of Israel, they weren't just given a weekly sabbatical. They weren't just given a weekly sabbatical. They were also given a, a, an annual sabbatical. And then they were given a, a kind of every seven years sabbatical, where they wouldn't be allowed to grow any crops on that seventh year. So the far, everyone, because everyone was farmers, stopped. They had, it, they had a year off. That's amazing, isn't it? And then every seven of those seven years, they'd have an extra year off. So on the 50th year, they'd have a jubilee year. And that's why it's called a jubilee. Because you have two years off in a row. Now imagine living in a culture where you did that. Imagine living in a world where there is sabbatical. Now the warriors among us would go, well, we can't afford to take time off, can we? I mean, surely someone's got to look after things. And, and that's what happens. The people of Israel found it very difficult to do sabbatical. Because who's going to do the stuff if, you, if you're not doing it? Who's going to do the stuff? And the same is true for me. It's really hard for me to do sabbatical. I know you, some of you are thinking, no, that sounds easy to me. You just disappear. But it's really hard because, because there's something else in me. There's an engine in me that says, well, who's going to do the PowerPoint when I'm gone? I know that's the silliest thing to point at. But do you know what I mean? Who's going, who's going to do the stuff? Who's going to do all sorts of stuff? Who's going to welcome people on Sunday mornings? Who's going to be that person to do that? We have to trust, don't we? In a sabbatical, you have to trust that, so, that this thing is held. I'm coming into land. I saw this uh, notice on an American website. It said, now is a good time to visit this church because our pastor is on vocation. <laughs> So maybe, maybe we could put that on. Now is a good time to come because Rich is on sabbatical. <laughs> yeah. So maybe when I come back, I'll see the place packed. <laughs> the four things I want to do on this time are to rest, to reconnect, to be recreated, and to reflect. And whilst I'm recognizing that I'm being given this extra special time, and I'm very grateful for it, uh, these things are not, these things should be part of my weekly rhythm, my daily rhythm, and my annual rhythms as normal part of life, just as they were Jesus for Jesus. And Jesus had to work in order to make it possible for him to find these places. He had to withdraw up a mountain. He had to leave the house, leave the washing up, leave the untidiness, leave the kids, leave the noise. He had to leave in order to go up the mountain to be on his own. These things are within reach, but we have to choose to do them. So maybe these four things, although you can see that I want to do those four things, and I want them for myself, maybe you can say, well, how can I access some of these things? Where are my moments of rest in my life? Where are the moments of reconnection? It's so hard, to, you know, because the engine of the world just keeps going. You get up in the morning, and there's another day, and you just feel out of connection with each other, with your family, my friends went on, on a half-term holiday this week, and um, I said, how was it? He said, it was good. We went to a youth hostel, and I said, it was good? 
And he said, yeah, we went to youth hostel. We went with some friends. And I said, you went to a youth hostel with some friends and it was good? He said, yeah, although their kids and our kids didn't really always get on. And he sa- I said, why didn't you go on your own? He said, well, we thought my wife's an extrovert and I thought we'd better to go with some friends because she'd enjoy that. And I said, how do you feel? He says, I feel knackered. <laughs> and I feel like I haven't connected to my kids. This one precious week of, of their, their kind of period up to Christmas. And, and he, he's coming home. Oh, no, I need to come back to work for a, ra- a break. Now, you see, we, we, we forget that we need to reconnect with each other, with ourselves, with nature, with God. So, where's your moments of reconnection? Where's your moment of recreation where you, you get to play? I, I've forgotten how to play. I'm going to play on a camper van. That's my playing. And, and I feel embarrassed about telling people that I've got a camper van to play on uh, because it doesn't sound very productive or spiritual or anything like that. And all it is is me playing. It's because I, I don't have time to play. And I need a time of play. So where's your time of play? Do you have a time of play? And where's your time of reflection where you have time to flipping think? Do you have any time for thinking? Yeah. So now, now, as I look at that list, and I've just said that out to you, I could see your reflections back at me. You were, you were going, oh, I haven't got that. Oh, no. You were looking more depressed. You sound more depressed. You feel more depressed now than you were a moment ago. You thought your lives were in rhythm and you were going fine. And you're now looking to me like, oh, my life's rubbish. I'm rubbish. But don't, don't feel that, but just think, okay, well, if I'm going to in- increase a little bit of these things, how would I get that? A little bit more time reflection. Where would I find that in the day? Where would I find that? There is a time to push the, the walls down. There is a time to stop doing stuff. There is a time. There is a time to scatter stones, to kill something off. There is a time for that. And maybe some of us need to hear that today. Maybe that's God's word for us today, that it's a time to stop something. It's okay. It's a time to stop. I don't know if I've got one more screen left, but uh, here we go. Don't let this graph rule your life. It wasn't Jesus' graph. It wasn't Jesus' graph. And... Instead, let this graph rule your life. Shall we pray together? Would you like to stand together?